In your Bible, the book of Romans chapter 3, I have a subject that is so big, so wide, so grand, that if I preach everything about it, we will be here tonight at 7 o'clock. But I won't do that, and I don't think you'd stay, but it is a great big subject, and I can't cover it all, but I'll give you as much as I can. Romans chapter 3 in your Bible, and the subject today, man's greatest problem. Man's greatest problem, and of course, I speak of sin. If you will stand with me in Romans chapter 3, we begin reading God's Word in verse 10. And why don't you read with me, everybody aloud together today, all right, beginning in verse 10, everybody. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Thank you, and you may be seated. You have just read the Romans' description of sin as presented here by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, beginning in verse 10. This is part of a series. It's really, I've not made much of the series, but I've tried to take the elements of salvation, the various pieces, if you will, of the puzzle, and I've tried to preach on each of them topically to make them clear in the minds of everyone here. I began the series preaching on so great a salvation. The second message was on the love of God from John chapter 3 and verse 16. And then I preached on the gospel. What is good news? And then last week, the subject was what is repentance? But all of those would be unnecessary if it were not unnecessary for me to preach on them, if it were not for the problem that we're dealing with. The problem is sin. So man's greatest problem, and I don't think anybody, at least anybody who is a Christian would argue with me for a moment that man's greatest problem is his sin. The moral infection that is common to every single person. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great British preacher, said, Sin is the moral disease that affects all people. Sin is universal. It is the flawed condition of evil and guilt and susceptibility to death that is inherited by all human beings except Christ, beginning all the way back to Adam, end of quote. David Jeremiah defines it in this way. He says, sin is a conscious, intentional violation of God's will as revealed in His Word. It is a lifestyle. Now, listen to this. This gets to the root of the thing, I think. A lifestyle that shows contempt for God's commands. What is sin? It is a lifestyle that shows contempt for the commandments of God. I submit to you, number one, that sin is a universal condition, a universal condition. We read all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We read that there is none righteous, and then the emphasis, no, not one. In the New Testament, there are four words that are used or translated sin or some form of some derivation of it. Actually, there's five, but I won't get into the fifth one. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, the passage you've just read, all have sinned. Note the word sin there. It's a word that means to miss the mark, to miss the mark. 
to commit an error. I'm a baseball fan, and I've been watching the Braves in this series they've had, and they're playing the Los Angeles Dodgers now. And the other night I was watching in Colorado. I got to feeling sorry for those fellows in Colorado. The Braves had about 10, and they had about one or two. And I think there were four errors by the Colorado Rockies. Uh, The ball would be hit to them, a routine play, and they would muff it. They would drop it or they'd miss throw it or something would happen. And they, every time it was called an error. Well, that's what sin is. It is to commit an error in the moral, uh, in the moral sense of the word, not the baseball sense. It means to be mistaken or to make a mistake. It means to wander from the path. It means to violate God's laws, and we're back again to the lifestyle that shows contempt for the commandments of God. The second word is in chapter 4 and verse 15. Turn there with me, if you will, one page over. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. And the word is transgression, translated for us. And it has the idea of trespassing. So there's a sign on a piece of property, no trespassing. It means I'm not to step over the boundary. I'm not to enter into that area. And that's what the Bible calls transgression or trespassing, if you will, to overstep the boundary. And so sin is going on to an area, entering an area that God has forbidden us to go into, transgression. And then chapter 5 and verse number 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. And the word offense in your English Bible is the idea of to blunder, to blunder, again, to be in error, to make mistakes, spiritual mistakes, moral mistakes, if you will. And then the last year's use of it is in 1 John chapter number Three And turn way over there to the back of your Bible, if you will. First John chapter 3 and verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And it's, the word is lawless here. The idea is lawlessness. Of, it's the idea of wickedness. It's the idea of iniquity, of violating God's standards, if you will. Now, all of these I've mentioned to you are sins of commission, things that people participate in positively that they do. But on the negative side, there are also sins of omission, sins of omission, where we should do something and we don't do it, where we, there is a command, but we violate the command, sins of omission. It's not that we did anything wrong, it's that we should have done the right James talks about that in chapter 4 and verse 17. He says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. And so we go over to the fire department, and the bell rings, and there's a fire, and the fellows are deep into a game of uh, checkers or cards or something, and they say, well, we'll just wait a few minutes. We'll finish the game, and then we'll go fight the fire. We neglect our duty. And in the same way, we neglect our duty spiritually. We know what our duty is. We know what is right. Our conscience conscience tells us that. And yet we say, well, I'm not going to do it, or I'll do it later. We put it off. We neglect. We procrastinate. And so there's a whole range of sins there. We call them the sins of omission, failure to obey, neglect of duty, or whatever you want to call it. The ancient theologians back way early in the centuries, in the first or second century, they came up with a list of sins. And this is very interesting because you don't even hear the term anymore. They call them the seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins. Now, the idea of the seven deadly sins is what are the sins that when they grow, when they flourish, they produce all the other sins. They're the root sins, if you will of life. And what are those seven deadly sins? Well, I look in my Bible and I see pride. They said the first deadly sin, in fact, the greatest deadly sin was pride. And then they said it's greed. 
because greed produces so much other sin. And then they said they used the word anger or wrath. And then there was envy, jealousy and envy of other people. And then there's lust, desires that are forbidden. And then they put in another one in the list, and we don't hear much about it today. It's called gluttony. I won't stay there very long. But they said it's a deadly sin because of what it produces, gluttony. And then they had one more, and it was sloth, or it was laziness, the seven deadly sins. They put laziness in those seven sins. Now, why did they do it? If you notice, all seven of those sins are internal. They're not out there hurting other people. So people have the idea, sin if it hurts somebody. No, the seven deadly sins, all of them named in the Bible, all of them forbidden in the Bible, and those seven sins are the sins that produce other things. For example, pick anger there, if you will. And so somebody gets anger, they can't control their temper. They get angry, they can't control their temper. And so they strike out at somebody, violence or, or, or uh, crime or even murder. So see, these sins precipitate other sins. Pride was the original sin, the sin of Satan. It may be the greatest of all the sins. It produces more problems than anything else because people are proud. The seven deadly sins that we are to guard against and to watch for. Now, another thing about sin, sin is so much a part of our nature that even devout Christians continue to sin. There's nobody without sin. And the verse on that, of course, is in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. Listen to it. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and God's truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sins, there's a couple of branches of Christianity that teach a doctrine called sinless perfection, meaning that you can grow in grace, you can become such a mature Christian, such a powerful Christian, if you will, that you will reach a state where it's impossible for you to sin no more. I don't know why anybody would could believe that if they call themselves a Christian and read 1 John chapter number 1 and verse 8. If we say we have no sin, if, anybody, if you ever meet anybody who claims they don't sin, you've just met a liar. You've met a person who's deceived by Satan himself. There is no such person as a person who doesn't sin. The greatest Christians you've ever known, including the Apostle Paul, and Peter, and John back in the apostolic era, you've never met a person who didn't sin. Now, here's the point. We don't revel in that. We don't just blow that off. As we mature in Christ, as I grow in my faith, we will sin with less frequency. And we'll also sin usually in less serious ways. We'll still fight the internal sins. But we will be able to overcome some of those coarser, grosser sins, that uh, the sins of the flesh, as we grow in grace, we will grow in our ability to, avoid, to overcome temptation. In fact, didn't the Lord say for us to pray about that in the Lord's Prayer? He said, keep us from temptation. And so the whole idea is, is that we grow out of our sins, but we never reach a state where we are perfected and we no longer sin. And so sin is universal. It affects every one of us. I deal with sin and temptation every single day of my life, and I know that you do too. Number one, our sin is our universal condition. Number two, quickly, most of you know this, but I should touch on it. Where did sin originate? The origin of sin. Where did sin come from? What is the source of sin? Well, of course, as I've already stated, sin originated when pride was found in the heart of Satan. Apparently, Satan was the most beautiful of all the angels. He was the archangel. He was nearest the throne of God. Satan was the, the highest of the high under God himself. And pride was found in him. He actually came to a point 
where he believed that he could rebel against God and remove God from power. And so he rebelled against God. The Bible says there was a war in heaven. A third of the angels followed him. And he rebelled against God. And he came down to the earth later, and he deceived Eve. The woman was first in sin because of deception, the Bible says. She was deceived. Adam loved that little gal so much, he followed her right into the temptation. He couldn't say to her, no, woman, that's wrong. He had to eat of the fruit as well. He followed her into temptation. And when that happened, something happened. Something happened. The most incredible happening maybe in, in the history of the world. You see, man, Adam and Eve, were created in God's image. They had God's spiritual, intellectual, emotional, moral image stamped upon them. But they also inherited Adam's nature. Now, listen to me carefully. I am not a sinner because Adam sinned. I've met many Christians. They think that. Well, I'm a sinner because Adam sinned. No, I'm a sinner because I sinned. <laughs> I inherited Adam's nature. I inherited his tendency, his propensity to sin. But I am not guilty because of Adam's sin. I'm guilty because of Bill's sin. Now, get a hold of that. That's very, very important. You can't blame Adam for what you did. <laughs> Y'all don't have any sense of humor today. You're, you're, you're thinking about that race this afternoon or something, aren't you? Okay. I am not, I, I'm not a sinner because Adam sinned. I, we inherited that nature, and we sinned, and so we are guilty, not of Adam's sin, but of our own sin. That nature was passed down through the generations. It's in my DNA today. Now, the secular person, the person who doesn't believe Scripture, the person who is an atheist, an agnostic, the unbeliever, the secularist, he believes that man's nature is basically good. When the Bible says we've all sinned, the Bible is saying basically we all have this inherited tendency that we, we sin, and we're all sinners because we've all sinned. But um, you, the secularist doesn't believe that. The secularist usually is an evolutionist, and he thinks that ultimately over time, given enough time, that in fact man will overcome his evil tendencies. And he usually believes something like this. He believes that sin is a social construct. Sin is a social problem. It comes about because of environment, not an inherited sin nature. It and he believes, and the world around us believes it. Just listen to the news. Listen to the political situation or uh, solutions that are proposed. Just, just follow what the Congress is introducing as a bill or the House or the Senate, even in our own state, or even the laws at a local level. And the, and the idea is this. If we get, if, if people can have the right education and they can have just laws, and they're given economic opportunity, then they're going to they're gonna grow out of this thing. That sin is caused by the environment. It's, it's a social construct. Man is basically good. He's got that spark of divinity, and we just need to create conditions where we fan that, and the fire will, will burn in given, given time. And unless you have a biblical worldview, Unless you are a biblical-oriented Christian, you are going to, uh, you're going to think that, that man probably is good because there's so much about man that is good. There's so much nobility about us because we have this image of God thing. Even though it's flawed, even though it's broken, even though it's hidden, it's still there. And so men do some wonderful, noble, good things. But underneath, there is that fallen, broken nature that we inherited down through the centuries from Adam. 
And so what does God think about our sin? We talk about the, a lot about the love of God. I'm afraid that in modern Christianity, we don't talk enough about God's attitude towards sin. You see, get this, write this down if you're taking notes with me. Sin offends God. It deeply offends God. It offends God so much that at times He's poured out His wrath upon sin and upon the earth. You can talk about the flood. You can talk about the fall in Genesis 3. You can talk about God's judgment on individuals and upon nations down through the years. Sin offends God. We don't think that anymore. And here's the reason why. Just like when my children were little children, and I would tell them something, and they would willfully disobey me, it showed a disrespect for me. Now, Christian, listen to me. When you know what is the right thing, and you refuse to do it, and you just do, say, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care. Here's what you're really doing. You're showing disrespect to the Heavenly Father, to your Creator. You're disrespecting Him when you know what God wants you to do, and you say, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what, what the truth of the Word of God is. I'm going to do what I want to do. And so willful disobedience of the commands of God shows disrespect to God Himself, to the person of Him. I want you to turn in your Bible the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 25, turn all the way back there, and it tells us something interesting about God's attitude towards sin. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 16, for all that do such things, and it's been describing all manner of sin, things like cheating in business and things like that, all that do such things and all that do unrighteously, that do unrighteous things are an abomination to the Lord thy God. All that do such things, these sinful things that are listed there, they're an abomination to God. An abomination is a horror. An abomination is repulsive. I don't want to be too crude, but I'm walking through my neighborhood on a, I'm walking down a road, and somebody's hit a dog, and there's a carcass of a dead animal. It's repulsive. I don't go up to it and give it a minute inspection. I walk around it and get as far from it as I can, and I go on my way. That really is the essence of the word abomination there, that God doesn't want anything to do with it. It's repulsive to Him. Do you know how what God's attitude is about sin. Oh, if I could preach this to every Christian in America today. In Genesis chapter 6, I think it's verse 6, God looked down at that antediluvian world, much like the world of today, of course, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be so. And the Bible says it was like today. God looked down on that world, and what was God's attitude toward the antediluvian world? It grieved him that he had made man. God repented himself. It even uses that term. It's almost as if God regretted the fact that he created man. Now, I don't want to get into the explanation of all that right now, but it caused God to, it grieved his heart that he had even made man because of their sin. That's God's attitude. Because sin is contrary to God's character. It is contrary to what He made us to be. It's, it's like a child goes into a life of crime and disappoints the parent. And in the same way, the Heavenly Father looks at people who are flagrantly sinning, and it disappoints Him in them. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, that's one of those little prophetic books over there just before the New Testament, Habakkuk. And he describes God in this way, Lord, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look on iniquity 
or on wickedness. God is so holy that he will not even look upon sin. He turns his face. Do you remember when Christ was hanging on the cross and all the sins of the world were placed upon him? And what did God do? He blacked out the sun. He couldn't even look upon his own son as he bore the evil, the wickedness, the iniquity, the sins of the world. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we forget how God views sin. We think he views sin as we view sin. Uh Uh-uh. No, no. See, we're not absolutely pure. We're not absolutely holy in the sense that God is. And what what might seem a very light thing to me, a trivial thing, a picadillo, a little tiny flaw, what may seem that to me is a big thing to God because He is so holy, so righteous, so pure. Another thing about God's laws and God's attitude towards sin, His laws are objective. His laws are not relative. They're not situational. God doesn't believe in situational ethics that the circumstances depend on whether something is right or wrong. God has given us absolute moral values, we say. In our day, sin has become very relative. People have said to me things like, well, I don't feel it's wrong. Wait, when did wrong become a matter of how I feel about it, huh? When did wrong become the, the basis of our, our feelings? I just don't feel it's wrong, preacher. A few years ago, you may remember the story, a nurse in Cincinnati, Ohio, by the name of Donald Harvey, killed 24 patients in a nursing home. He put cyanide, even rat poison, in their IVs and killed 24 people over a period of several years. And when he was arrested, he said this, I did it to help them. I wanted to put them out of their misery. I only did it to the people who were in the worst condition, who were suffering agonizing pain. I wanted to help them. And so that became the argument for Dr. Kevorkian, if you remember him. And today, what is there, 16 states that have assisted suicide laws? We are relativistic in our thinking. God says, thou shalt not kill. But somebody says, but there's a greater good. uh, Thou shalt not kill is a relative thing. It depends on the circumstances. Depends on the situation. Situation ethics, relativism has so taken over in our world. We've made God's laws elastic. We think we can stretch them and make whatever our thinking is fit into those laws. And so the pro-choice people say, well, it's better to take the life of a little child who's unconscious still in the womb of the mother. It's better to take his life than for it to grow up in a life of poverty and misery where it never has an opportunity. This was the rationale for original abortion legislation. Homosexuality is accepted. The president, the former president said, People ought to have the right to love whoever they want. It's all over our pop culture. I don't know how many songs have been written that had a line something like this. It can't be wrong if it feels this right. And, of course, if it feels good, do it. And, of course, have it your way. All of those are phrases that help people justify and rationalize their sin. That love and feelings top, they trump the clear statements of the Word of God. And so you have a society today that is, we call it relativistic. Basically, we stretch the laws of God to the point that we can do whatever we wish and justify it and rationalize it. Now, I know this is, this is a hard saying, isn't it? 
When did you go to church and hear a whole sermon on sin? You see, we don't even talk about it. It's, it's so common and it's so pervasive. It's, we become desensitized to evil in our, in our times. So what is our attitude towards sin? We talked about God's attitude. What's our attitude towards sin? Calvin Coolidge was the president back in the 1930s. They call him Silent Cal. He was a man of very few words. They said he could just, he, he would say the very minimum about everything. And so he went to church one Sunday without his wife when he was in the White House. He came home for lunch, and the wife said, well, what was the sermon about, Cal? He said, sin. She said, what did the preacher say about it? He said, well, he was mostly against it. He was mostly against it. And I'm afraid that today we're mostly against it, but we've left a lot of loopholes where we don't want to be against it, <laughs> and so we can justify our sin. I want you to turn to a verse that's been a powerful verse in my life. I discovered it many, many years ago, and oh, what a verse it is. It's in Psalm number 97. Psalm number 97. And if I quoted it, you could probably finish the quote because I use it fairly often. But I'd like for you to mark it in your Bible. I, I want you to see it with your eyes and not just pass by it. Psalm 97 and verse 10, ye that love the Lord hate evil. If you love the Lord, then you hate sin in all of its manifestations, in all of its types. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. I'm going to very quickly give you, now don't roll your eyes, it's going to be quick. I'm going to give you six reasons you ought to hate sin as a Christian. You may not have time to write them down, but I'll go quickly. Number one, we hate sin for what it did to Jesus. That's the big one. We hate sin for what it did to our Lord. Nothing reveals the nature of sin and evil like the cross. Go with me in your mind's imagination and stand at the foot of the cross and see the crown of thorns and the blood running down his face. See him spread eagle there and he's naked, the Son of God, before the world as they curse and ridicule and mock and scoff at him. They drive the nails through his hands, and now the holes are enlarging as he struggles there on the cross. I look at his feet, and they're nailed there too. I look at his back that has been cut open and bleeding for me. I see the blood pooling. I see Jesus Christ suffering like few people have ever suffered. And I say, why? I look up at that awful scene, and I say, why? And an angel comes and whispers in my ear, one reason, sin. He's here because of the sins of the world. He's here because of your sin and the sins of the world. Number one, we hate sin for what it did to Jesus. Number two, we hate sin for what it's done to the world. And so we don't live in the world that God created. We don't live in the pre-Genesis 3 world of paradise. We live in a broken world, a fallen world, a world where sin now has worked its will now for these thousands of years. Number three, I hate sin because it separated us from God. I was made in God's image. I had abilities and potentialities that I no longer have. Something went wrong. Something is broken. We're lost. And we're not only lost in this world, but we are potentially separated from God, not only in life, but also eternally. And in Revelation 21, it talks about the second death. The second death is the lake of fire. It's hell. It's eternal separation from God and punishment for rejection of Jesus Christ. 
Number four, we hate sin because it separated us from one another. And there's hate in the world. And there's greed in the world. And there's crime in the world. And there's terrorism in the world. And there's the ultimate. There's war. Look at what is happening. Bombing and killing innocent women and children and civilians and old people and children. Horrible. The horrors of war. The ultimate demonstration of a broken, fallen, violent world. Number five, we hate sin because it separates man from himself. You say, what do you mean? Francis Schaeffer dwelt on this a lot in his books. And he talked about the psychological pain and alienation that all people feel by virtue of their human condition. Even the people that deny sin's reality feel guilt and remorse and despair and depression and hopelessness, meaninglessness. And today we have an explosion of suicides and depression. Why? Sin. Sin is so deeply ingrained into this culture that it separated us psychologically, even from our own selves. We don't understand ourselves. Number six, we hate sin because it brought death. The wages of sin is death. Every person that dies in the United States, we fill out a death certificate. It has a little blank there. It says cause of death, heart attack, stroke, Gunshot, accident, whatever it is. Every one of them have a cause of death. There's a deeper cause, and you can put it on every death certificate. The wages of sin is death. They died because of sin. There was no death until Adam and Eve sinned. There's not one evil that sin has not brought me. There's not one good that has come in its train. It has cursed me through life. Its sorrows have sought me every step of the way through want, sickness, and pain. And when this life of affliction is ended, oh, what a home for my soul did prepare, the wrath of him whom my sins have offended. And the night the dark night of eternal despair. Our attitude towards sin, you that love the Lord, hate evil. I end with this thought. Good preachers don't tell people they're about to end. <laughs> I should not have said that because some of you will close your Bible, get your purse, Put on your coat, fix your makeup, and you'll be out of here. But it's been a pretty serious sermon, but I want to tell you one more point. There is a remedy. Amen. There is a remedy. I was blessed by that song by the quartet a while ago. It talked about the remedy for sin. Romans 6 and 23. We always quote the first part, the wages of sin is death. What's the rest of the verse? The gift of God is what? Life, eternal life, God's gift. That's the one remedy for sin today. And how did that come about? Because, you see, when they sinned, God said there's a penalty for your sin. In the day that you sin, you will die. So sin required the death of the sinner, the one who sinned. Sin required the death of the sinner as payment to God for their evil. But in Hebrews 9 and 22, it even says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But listen to me. And here is the beauty of the gospel. Here is the glorious gospel. The whole series that I'm preaching on is about this and trying to bring all of its elements together. The beauty of the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins. Galatians 1 and 3, Christ gave himself for our sins. 
1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. Matthew 20 and 28, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for sins. 1 John 4 and 10, he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I could quote you that many more verses that tell us that the remedy for sin was paid for in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that our men sung about a moment ago. Christ died for us. And the Bible says, if I will repent of my sins, change my mind, as I said last week about my past sins, and I turn to the cross of Christ, and I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that what he did there was for me and me personally, then he will wipe my slate clean. He will forgive me of my sins. He will give me eternal life, and I will be able to be with him when this life is over. Isn't that wonderful today? That's why we call it the good news of the gospel of Christ. The penalty has been paid. Someone said, I believe truth is stronger than error, and light is stronger than darkness, and love is stronger than hate, and right is stronger than wrong, and the gospel of Christ is more powerful than all the lies of Satan. And we believe that today, so we don't leave here hopeless because of the darkness around us. We know the light, and we have the light living within us if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, if you've never, come to, if you've never been to Christ in repentance and faith, if you've never come and humbled yourself and said, oh, God, I am a sinner, I acknowledge that, and I repent of my sins, I turn from them, and give me strength now to live for you. If you haven't done that, I want you to come today. And if you're a Christian here today and you've wandered off the path, you've trespassed into the forbidden territory, you've neglected the things You have committed the sins of omission more than the sins of commission. I want you to come and kneel at this altar here. If you want, one of our men will pray with you. But I want you to walk out this door today knowing that Christ has taken care of your sin debt. Please do that today. And our heads are bowed as we close our service here this morning. Is this road you're traveling, dark, discouraged, or dim? Is there hope for tomorrow? Put your trust in Him. Oh, yes, oh.